Today I'm going to be preaching from the book of Boulder. Um, This is really the fruit of the last two and a half years of my life. I wrote this book. I'm busy like all of you. I wrote this book in three-hour blocks every Saturday and Sunday morning for two and a half years at Panera. One, (laughs) truly, one cup of hazelnut coffee and an everything bagel. So you do the math, and I don't know how many bagels I've eaten, but it's far, far too many. Uh, You know, just listening to to, to Cody, um, a major healthcare group asked me to come and speak to some of their senior executives a while ago, and they wanted me to talk to them about how to provide care for the frail elderly, and they invited me because they knew what I was going to say. Uh, And essentially, my answer was, I have no freaking idea. Um, You know, because when I talk, uh, and I talk to a lot of groups, and our message is always, it's never too late, it's never too late, it's never too late, But, but candidly, when I'm talking to some groups of seniors, Uh, in CCRCs or assisted living, I'm saying, it's never too late, it's never too late. And I'm thinking to myself, except for you and you and you and you. (laughs) And you can feel that. So what I told them, what they really wanted me to tell them, is if you want to provide health care to the frail elderly, if you want to change the way the really old people uh, live, uh, if you want to improve their health and well-being, you, you back out and you change the lifestyle of people in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s. Uh, And and I can tell you that, yes, we do produce content on people from 50 to 100 to 110, uh, but inevitably, the people that come up and talk to me first when I'm done speaking, the people who email us most passionately are 20 and 30 and 40-year-olds, because we're providing a a different vision of aging than any of us uh, have been raised with. I hope you guys are are excited uh, about this week about your businesses, uh, and and about your life in general, because in a very real way, we have all won the mega life lottery. Modern man has been on this planet for about 300,000 years, give or take. And for 99.9% of that time, the average life expectancy was 19. In 1935, in this country, when the Social Security Act determined that 65 is the age at which we should receive full retirement benefits, The average life expectancy was 62. Yeah. (laughs) You you see what they did there. The average person died three years before becoming eligible for full retirement benefits. Today, the fastest growing demographic in this country is over 85. The number of nonagenarians, those in their 90s, will quadruple over the next 30 years, and the number of centenarians will grow eightfold. There is now an entirely new life stage that has never before existed in the history of mankind. It's not a given. It's an opportunity. And it's an opportunity for two, for three, and maybe even four decades of active, engaged social life beyond what has been considered normal retirement age. This is huge. It's a new opportunity to get it right. But again, it's not a guarantee. It also brings with it a lot of challenges. We're worried about it. We're concerned about it. We all wonder what's next. So that, as a segue to a chapter in my book, while I was writing it, I love the concept of a launch pad to what's next. A major senior development community asked me to come and talk to them about what they could do to be different. And I said, well, first of all, forget the idea of retirement. Even though you call yourself a retirement community, the people that are aging into this community have no interest in retiring for life. This is not the time to retire from life. Not yet. They're looking for a launch pad to what's next. They want help figuring out how they can finally chase their passions, pursue their interests. So, as I'm writing this, American Public Television puts out a all-points request. They want to have a national competition. They ask producers to submit ideas for a brand-new pledge show that targets the 50-plus demographic. Because, as you guys know, those are the people with the money, contrary to what advertisers think. Uh, we want to get the 50-plus demographic more engaged than they are in public broadcasting. Uh, we've never produced a pledge show Pledge is a weird animal. You can produce a great program, but nobody gives you any money. Um, So we thought about it, and I thought, you know, I've I've been writing something about a launch pad to what's next. So we entered it, sent the application. We were named a semifinalist. 
Uh, we were named a finalist. I had to fly to Baltimore and compete on stage. Pitch Fest Live, five finalists. Me, uh, the, the head of production for WETA, WETA in Washington, D.C., uh, one of the main producers for WNET in New York City, uh, the guy who produced Wayne Dyer's pledge shows, on uh, the production company that produced Susie Orman's pledge shows, and me. And I've never done anything like that. <clears throat> so I pitched the concept of Launchpad to What's Next Live. I ended up with the first place $75,000 check. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you. I'd feel pretty damn good about it if we hadn't already spent twice that much. Uh, <laughs> to produce the show. <laughs> One of the tenets at Growing Boulder, because we have a very small team, is we repurpose, we repurpose, we repurpose, we repurpose. We never produce one piece of content that we don't use in a hundred different ways. Uh, we've got a magazine. There are samples of it out there. I hope you'll look at it. It's a phenomenal magazine. We've just upgraded it. It's high quality. It's gorgeous. We have a who's who of interesting and cool people in there. And people say to us, how do you get these people? Where do you, how do you get them with your small staff? And, and here's, this, here's, here's the secret. we got a radio show in Orlando. It's the most listened to non-music program in the market. But it's only in Orlando. So we go after, we see somebody big, we see somebody we want to talk to, we go after them and their booker, their agent says, how big is your footprint? And we tell them and they say, sorry, ain't going to happen. They're doing five interviews. And uh, it will not be with you. It'll be New York, L.A., Philadelphia. And they say, wait a second, let, let me send you the, this week's engagement report from Facebook. Uh, we've got 900,000 people who follow us on Facebook, which is not a bad number, but our weekly engagement number, despite the fact that Facebook changes its algorithm on a daily basis and they totally have hammered everybody, we have never paid a penny to boost a post. Everything we have done is 100% organic and authentic. Uh, we have more engagement on our Facebook page than PBS and Oprah and AARP combined. Uh, 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 this past week, our actual engagement, the people who comment, uh, share, or, what is engagement? Comment, share, or like, thank you, uh, uh, was 350,000. It used to be 2.5 million a week. But anyways, we send that to the booker of this person we're trying to get on the radio show, and we say, by the way, it just won't air in Orlando. It'll be posted on Facebook, and you'll have far more reach than if they're interviewed by a station in New York. So then they say, yeah. So we get them on a radio show, and we say, oh, by the way, one more thing. You need to understand that we're going to transcribe the uh, radio interview. Uh, and we're going to turn it into an article for our magazine. And also, we need high-resolution photography and the rights to use it. Uh, and nobody has ever told us no. So now we've produced this gorgeous magazine without ever having to get a single interview exclusively for it. The, the beauty of repurposing content. So when we won this, we said, all right, we're going to produce a pledge show. Um, but let's make it more than that. Uh, I want it to have legs. I want to do more with that. So we said we're going to do it in front of a live audience, uh, and then we're going to turn it into a national tour. And we're going to take Growing Boulder's Launchpad to What's Next Live on a tour all around the country. Uh, we taped the program two weeks ago uh, in the Villages, Florida, in front of a sold-out audience. Uh, here's the open to the show just to give you an idea. The world is filled with unprecedented opportunity. At any point, you can start an entirely new chapter. It's never too soon or too late to make the rest of your life the best of your life. We all wonder one thing, what's next and how do I create it? This is Growing Boulder's Launchpad to What's Next. Hey, you could be larger than life. Coming up, long distance swimming icon Diana Nyad, Blue Zone's founder Dan Butner, personal finance expert Gene Chatsky, longevity expert Dr. Roger Landry. 
three-time Olympic gold medalist, Rowdy Gaines. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Roger McGuinn. Performance coach, Dr. Jim Smith Jr. Aging transformation expert, Dr. Bill Thomas. Award-winning journalist, Bill Schaefer. Lifestyle expert, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. And your host, founder. You know who I am. Um, <clears throat> so that's the open to the show. Uh, I can't show you any video from the show. Uh, American Public Television won't allow us to do that. It will be released in December. Uh, it'll be made available to every public tele uh, broadcasting television station in America. But we wanted to, to share some of the vibe that night. So without violating our deal with American Public Television, we used some stills and some of the reaction from the audience to do this. <laughs> place was mobbed today, was sold out. Uh, that just shows you how much interest there is in this kind of thinking. The speakers were great. I thought it was an excellent, excellent program. I really did enjoy it. I love their message about changing the way we look at aging and changing the way people age by their own behavior, by their own thoughts, and by their own choices. That was huge. I thought it was phenomenal. It was inspiring. It was informative, educational, and it was just really an uplifting show, for sure. I thought it was fantastic. It really was in alignment with my belief system, and so um, I just loved hearing the message, each person saying it in a different way. It was amazing. I mean, it, it seemed to, to every one of us that we were saying, we are living these things, but we needed validation. If there was ever any validation, we got it tonight. I love Mark Middleton's message. He actually was probably my favorite speaker because his message was so profound. I'm a big fan of Mark's and Bill Schaefer. I thought Bill was awesome tonight, a lot of fun, and the whole production was just really well done. Let me tell you, this was so inspiring. This Growing Boulder organization is phenomenal. Growing Boulder means to me doing all the things that I always wanted to do and being able to do them now. Growing Boulder is just that very thing, is choosing to age in a different way by how you think and how you behave. I liked the phrase tonight when they talked about looking at as you get older, not what you can't do, but what you can do. And um, there was all great examples and role models of um, nothing changes except I think your focus being fine-tuned and um, I enjoyed that message. I'm excited, I'm 80 years old and uh, I feel like I'm starting new because now I think I got 20 years to go. I see guys that are playing tennis at 100 and water skiing at 92 and I'm only 80, only I'm saying. And I never said that a year ago. And I really enjoyed it, and I got a lot out of it, and I'm ready to go run a marathon. I can't wait for you to see the show. Um, you know, one of the reasons that, that we won, uh, uh, I was bold when I got up on the stage in Baltimore, and with these other four finalists there, I looked at the judges before I made my presentation and said, there's two things, two differentiators at least uh, that are different between what I'm going to present and what everybody else is. And number one, Anybody that produces anything strictly for broadcast these days is short-sighted and behind the times. We're going to produce this show modularly, which we did, and as soon as the telecast is over, we are going to repurpose the individual talks and make them available to every public broadcasting station for use on smartphones, on uh, laptops, on all of these other devices, so they can, can, even social media, they can continue to run pledge after the broadcast is over. Uh, and secondly, public broadcasting has never given anybody immediate gratification. They want you to give them $6 a month for 12 months, $96. They want you to give them $15 a month, uh, uh, be become a sustaining member is what they call it. So because they're getting so little money from you each month, they never give you anything immediately. So we're now working with the two fulfillment houses that answer the phone and, and answer the clicks online when people make pledges. We've connected their APIs, and immediately, as soon as somebody pledges, they receive an email with an access code that gives them access to the Growing Boulder launch pad portal where we have additional information and all of the things that concern us and excite us, caregiving, functional fitness, travel, uh, all, all of the things. 
very extensive resources. We're hiring someone in adult online education. It will be a very unique portal. All of the experts that you saw and others are contributing content to it. And here's the cool thing. Yes, they, everybody that pledges gets in with an access code, but not until they give us their email address. So it becomes a great lead generator for Growing Boulder and those who are our partners. And at the end of the 18-month license period that American Public Television has this, guess who owns the launch pad to What's Next portal? It's us. Um, and, and, and this is, uh, you know, just a little look at the portal, and I'll slip by that very quickly because I want to talk a little bit about the uh, National Senior Games, which brings us to this, because I told you we don't want to do anything as a one-off. Um, so we are doing already the second Launchpad to What's Next live Tuesday night at the historic Chemo Theater in downtown Albuquerque in conjunction with the National Senior Games, already sold out. Uh, the National Senior Games has made tickets available exclusively to those who are competing, which, by the way, it's an all-time record, 15,162 athletes, which makes this the largest multi-sport competition in the world. Now, there are bigger individual sport competitions, but a multi-sport competition, there were 11,200 uh, competitors in Rio, uh, 15,162, and every one of them when they register in their bag is going to get a copy of Growing Boulder magazine, a special edition of Growing Boulder magazine <clears throat> for the National Senior Games in which I wrote an article about why we came. Uh, and I think it relates to everything that you do. We have not come to report any results. I could not care less about who wins. What I care about are the 15,162 stories and every one of them is different. Uh, there are some great athletes, but this National Senior Games, in my estimation, and I think that the majority of the athletes would tell you the same thing, it's not about the competition, it's about the socialization, it's about the tribe, it's about the encouragement, it's about the 60-year-old guy who's trying to lose weight, it's about the 80-year-old woman who had a heart attack a year ago, it's about the 50-year-old guy who had a stroke, it's about people that are trying to improve their overall health and well-being and they're doing it together. And we're interested not in the story, we're interested in the moral of the story. So we're bringing a team and we're going to produce a whole lot of content and we're going to take it back and, and put it all over our planet. Platform. I became interested in the National Senior Games when I read something that Dr. Vonda Wright wrote years ago. I think 16 years ago, she did a study when there are only 4,000 athletes at the National Senior Games. In-depth survey, and you guys may know more about these surveys. This one was made in, in, in Norway, I think, but it was an in-depth survey of the 4,000 competitors. And again, these are not hardcore athletes by any shape. Uh, and, and the survey determined that the overall fitness age of the competitors in the National Senior Games was 23 years, 25 years younger than their chronological age. The average chrono chronological age that year was 68. Their average fitness age was 43. And of course, this is important because fitness age uh, goes a whole lot further in determining how long we live than does our chronological age. Uh, so Vonda Wright is now a contributor to Growing Bold. I am so glad you asked me about what is our potential as we age because there is a terrible myth out there that aging is this inevitable decline from some vitality of youth down this slippery slope to frailty and aging and it is a myth based on watching populations of inactive people slide down the slippery slope. I believe that we can be healthy, vital, active, joyful until the very minute we take our last breath. I don't know about you, but I just want to quit breathing. I don't want to go down any kind of slippery slope. I wrote a chapter in the book, Rethinking Risk, The Life Expanding Power of Saying Yes. And, and I became interested in this when I read something about a concept called surplus safety, which was developed by a guy named Dr. Bill Thomas, who is a uh, geriatrician, Harvard-trained, deinstitutionalized nursing homes worldwide. The guy's an, he, he was in our show. Uh, he, he's an icon, an epic, uh, an epic icon, brilliant guy. And he came up with, uh, he deinstitutionalized nursing home. He's the guy that put gardens and pets and, you know, changed everything. You eat when you want. Uh, he came up with the idea of surplus safety as it relates to senior living. The notion that we become so concerned with downside risk 
what might go wrong, that we totally eliminate the opportunity for upside risk, what might happen. Uh, I've taken this, I'm not taking credit for taking this, but this to me immediately spoke to everything that we do. Uh, this is the age of opportunity, folks, if not now, when? Growing older is the time for taking risk. Uh, we become risk averse as we get older. No is our standard answer to everything. If you say no enough times, you will end up in your room, on the couch, watching TV with a miserable life. And when people get older, I can tell you it's, do you want to come to this event? No. You want to go out to dinner? No. You want to go to a movie? No. Do you want to meet a new person? No. Do you want to take a new class? No, 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 no. As we age, no is the kiss of death, and yes is the breath of life. Uh, so this surplus safety thing is, leads me to uh, my pal, Banana George. And if you've seen this, I've shortened it up. Uh, uh, Banana called me. He, he, he's now no longer with us, but he called me uh, several years back. He was 93, and I knew that he had been in bed with all sorts of serious stuff for a while. In the International Water Skiing Hall of Fame, the oldest person to this day to ever barefoot water ski. Every time he barefooted water skied from the time he was 85 until the time he died, or to, to this day, this was the last day he ever barefooted, it was a new world record. So he called me up and said, Mark, I'm going to ski one more time tomorrow. If you want to videotape it, come on out. Well, I knew he wasn't feeling well, and I knew I had to be there, so I was. It's been a tough year for 93-year-old Banana George. He's been bedridden for months with pneumonia and struggles with constant pain and stiffness from six major back surgeries and a broken neck. And all he wants to do is barefoot water ski one more time. Even though I've had every one of his doctors and family members call me and tell me this is not a good idea, I just, you know, I'm going to keep him as safe as I can and, and we're going to take him out there. and. Uh, this is what he lives to do. And so I'm trying to just help him do what he wants to do most. Well, of course I'm worried. <laughs> I'm worried every time he goes out on the water. I can't stop him. Nobody can stop him. So <laughs> believe me, I tried 10 years ago. <laughs> He's still out there. George has helped into a special contraption and his feet lowered onto the water. Barefoots for a second, spins and tumbles. You sure you're okay, Georgie? I'm positive. All right. You're an animal, George. That's what we keep telling him. You are an animal. I had his feet on the water, but because he was so light, he didn't have enough control to hold himself uh, this way. Heart. And when he started to spin, his wrists are so sensitive that as soon as he gets Ooh. spun a little bit, it hurts so badly he has to let go. George is satisfied with the effort and says he plans on skiing a while longer. <laughs> Forever! <laughs> Before we leave, George wants us to see the sign in his kitchen that sums up his philosophy of life, even at 93. Do it. All of life is up and down. I think uh, I don't wait for the next thing, but I make the next thing happen. I'm not growing older, I am growing bolder. How do you like that? <laughs> I played that video to a caregiving conference a while back. And as soon as it was done, at this moment, I looked at all these caregivers and said, had George died that day, would that have been a bad thing? And they're doing exactly what you're doing. This is a 93-year-old guy who lived to do uh, what he loved to do, uh, and he did it. And not only did he not die, uh, I believe that the, the vibe, the energy, the passion that he got from that effort kept him alive for five more years. He finally died at age 98. Uh, never skied again. That's the last video ever. Um, but yeah, that kept him going. I have a chapter in the book called A Tale of Two Futures because I mentioned off the top, this is the greatest time in the history of humankind to be alive. It's the age of opportunity, but unfortunately, it is also uh, the age of despair. Uh, I don't know if you've read this in the news, and probably next year it's going to be four in a row, but for the last three years in a row, there has been a decline in average life expectancy in this country. This has not happened in 100 years. The last time it happened was 1916, 17, and 18, uh, and then it was credited to World War I and the influenza pandemic. This time it's credited primarily to drug overdoses, primarily opioids, and suicides. 
both of which are rising rapidly in older age groups. Uh, why are there so many suicides? Again, probably a whole lot of reasons for that, but I'll name two of them. Uh, inadequate, inefficient, and expensive health care, uh, and flawed belief systems about what's possible. This is one of the things I love to talk about the most, uh, because I believe that we have all been brainwashed. We are all the victims of a very subtle form of cultural hypnosis. Multiple studies have shown that by the time we're three years old, we have a very flawed vision, a very ageist vision uh, about older people. And it continues to build and build as we go, to the extent that I think we have at least two self-images, the one that we carry around throughout our life, hopefully it's pretty good, uh, and then a future older self-image that we don't know exists. It's being built in the background in our subconscious from the time that we are two years old. It doesn't begin to exert itself. We don't realize it's there until we begin to feel the effects of age. 30 years old, 40 years old is when that begins to happen, and the sting of ageism. And then this older negative self-image begins to exert itself, and the prejudice that we have begins to turn on us. And don't say you are not ageist because you are. It's impossible, unless you've lived in a vacuum, to not be ageist. And oldest people, old people are the most ageist of all. So we have to disconnect from this thing. We have to somehow figure out how to overcome the ageism, because we have been literally hypnotized so that we can be monetized. Thousands of companies are spending billions of dollars every single year to make us feel less than, to make us hate our gray hair, our lack of hair, our wrinkles, every little bit about us. Self-acceptance is the ruination of their business, and they will stop at nothing to make us feel bad about ourselves. And this is what we deal with every single day. You know, it, it's interesting in that all of us have about 30,000 days to live, and like any commodity that has any value, and I think time should be the most valuable commodity of all, the less of it there is, the more valuable it becomes, but when it comes to time, our culture wants to view exactly the opposite. It begins depreciating each day beyond what it considers to be our prime. Well, here's a news flash for you folks. We are not here to lead lives of decreasing value and diminishing return. We are not here to withdraw from life as we get older. We are meant to lean into life. We are meant to be bold and to take risk. We are the greatest problem-solving, most empathetic, most passionate, most compassionate, most creative animal that has ever walked the face of this earth. And we didn't ask to be all that. We didn't choose to be all that. It chose us. It's in our DNA. And it's time we stop suppressing it and we start expressing it. And when we reach that point, and if you haven't already, you will, and it doesn't have to be a point where you get depressed, but at some point we realize that we have fewer tomorrows than we do yesterdays. And when that moment occurs, something important has to happen if it hasn't happened already. We have got to turn off the autopilot that has been mindlessly controlling our lives. We have got to disconnect from this propaganda machine that has told us what's possible as we age. Because I can tell you right now, we don't even know. The boundaries of possibility are being redrawn each and every day. And they will be redrawn again this week in the National Senior Games. So at that point, we have to stop. And we have to step back. And we have to ask ourselves... What's important? What really matters? And then we have to do that and forget all the other crap. And the way we do that is we work on our belief systems. Because the most important determinant of how we age is not our genetics. Depends on whatever research project you read. No one's in disagreement. Genetics account for 25%, 20%, 15%, 10%. The rest is lifestyle. And the most important lifestyle determinant of how we age is not our diet, and it's not our exercise. With all due respect to all of you people in this room, the most important lifestyle determinant of how we age is our belief system about aging. What the mind believes, the body embraces. Our psychology drives our physiology. What we put into our mind ends up in our body. You can say it however you want, but most of us anticipate the perceived negative benchmarks of aging so 
powerfully that we all but ensure that they will come to pass. So we have to change our belief system. That's not an easy task when we live in a culture that is aggressively and overtly ageist. So how do we do it? Well, at Growing Boulder, we do it by telling stories of someone like me. And I don't mean me, me. I mean the big me, someone like me. This is what we've learned more than anything else. When we can see ourselves and others, that's when the magic of personal transformation occurs. We can quote important people. We can share the results of big-time studies, and we do. But what we have learned that the spark only goes off. The magic of transformation occurs when we can see ourselves and others, and I mean that literally, and this is my favorite example, and if you've seen it, I apologize. I've not found a better one, but there's tons of them out there. This is Ida Keeling, 101 years old, a couple of years ago at the, at the uh, Penn Relays, big-time track meet. They had a special master's division. She was the oldest one in there. This was wor televised worldwide. She finished last in the master's division. She runs about this pace. Uh, but she set a new world record for women 100 to 104 by 17 seconds. <laughs> as soon as the race was over, she dropped down and did 10 push-ups right there on the <laughs> infield. Video of that, as you will understand, went viral. And guess who saw it? Ella Mae Colbert, she was 101 at the time, 103 now. She's sitting at home in South Carolina, never competed in sports at all, did some running when she was a young girl, and she thought, wow, look at what, uh, look at what Ida did. I think I could do that myself. So, you know, all of her fans and friends and relatives called Guinness Book of World Records. They set something up at the middle school track in this little town in South Carolina. Hundreds of people showed up, and they had a starter, and Ella Mae got on the starting line, take your mark, go. And she took one step, 101 years old, and did a face plant, split her chin wide open, bleeding profusely. She has to be done. She's 101 years old, if not forever for the day. But no, bandage me up. They did, and she broke Ida's record by 12 seconds. <laughs> Local TV was there. Video of that run went viral, and guess who saw it? <laughs> Julia Hurricane Hawkins. <laughs> Sitting at home, 101 years old at the time, in Louisiana. Entered the uh, U.S. National Masters Track and Field Championship and broke the record again by another 15 seconds, and suddenly the hottest division in track and field in the world <laughs> is women 100 and 104, all because of the power of example. And somewhere all over the world, not just other 100-year-old women or 60-year-old women or 50-year-old women, but 14-year-old girls and 8-year-old girls are realizing that it never has to end. And here's a great, we interviewed Julia. We interviewed her a week after she ran uh, and set the record. And I said, Julia, I, I know your background. Weren't you afraid? You've had cardiac issues. Um, you're 101 years old. Aren't you afraid you're going to fall? Aren't you afraid you're going to have an issue? And she goes, honey, I was afraid I was going to have a heart attack. I was afraid I was going to have a stroke. I was afraid I was going to fall and embarrass my family who was all there. I was afraid of so many things that I stayed home for a little extra while and took care of some personal business in case I never returned. But, <laughs> but honey, this is what you have to do as you age. You do what I do. You look fear in the face and you run. And of course, that was, she didn't mean that literally. We're not all going to run, but we have to look fear in the face. We have, to not, we have to not be afraid to engage. We have to not be afraid to fail. Take a class. Try something new. Meet a new person. The people that ultimately become good at something are only those who are okay with being bad at it for a while. Nobody's good at anything right away, so get over yourself and take a lesson from these people. <laughs> A uh, chapter in the book called Rock Stars of Aging, I, I, I say, and no one's proven me wrong, we've done more interviews with active centenarians than any media group in the world, but you know where I, the action is, the action is in the 90s, uh, the nonagenarians. I mean, this is where it is happening these days, and, and so let me just run through a couple of things. This is John Course. He's a friend of mine who lives in Jacksonville. He sent me this photo a couple of months ago on his 95th birthday, having a drink with his daughter. He, yes, he barefoot, or he water skied and sent me the video of him water skiing. The cool thing about John is um, 
he emailed me a, a week after this and said, Mark, that meme that you sent me um, is a PDF. And Facebook won't allow me to upload a PDF. Can you resend it to me as a JPEG? <laughs> this is a 94-year-old guy. Or 94. <laughs> Uh, Mayla Borg was 93 when her husband died, decided she finally wanted to pursue her lifelong dream of becoming an actress, so she did what any wannabe would do. She got in her car, she drove to L.A. Uh, <laughs> she, she got an agent. I mean, what agent in L.A. is going to turn down this woman? Uh, she worked incessantly until her death uh, at 101 in, uh, in film, television, and commercials. This is uh, Harry Bernstein uh, when his wife died. You know, when your spouse dies, that's... Let's try to figure out how to let the light go off before our spouses die. Uh, when, his, when his wife died, he was distraught. He didn't want to go any further. He pulled out his old IBM Selectric, Selectric typewriter and started to write down some of his memories so he could share with his grandkids. He liked the process so much his memories became a memoir. He spent three years trying to get it published. And, uh, when he was 96, Random House in London published his novel about growing up in the Jewish ghetto outside of London. Uh, it got rave reviews, and he published two more books uh, before he died at 101, and he told us in an interview the 90s were the greatest decade of my life. How exciting is that? Nola Ach at 96 got her bachelor's degree from Fort Hayes State University. At 98, she got her master's degree. She worked as a teaching assistant until she uh, passed away at 101 years old. Frida Lefebvre had no idea she had any artistic talent at all until someone in her retirement community saw the only the only drawing she had ever done of her four-year-old daughter when she was in her 20s. And, and, and her friend said, wow, who did that? Frida said, I did. And her friend said, you know, that's not bad. You've got some talent. And there's a moral here. Encourage one another. That's all she needed. That's all she needed was someone. How, how many people tell you when you're 78, which is how old she was at the time, that you've got talent at something. She enrolled at the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Arts. It took her six years to get her degree. She got her degree at 86, and at 101, she had her first ever one-woman gallery show and sold almost everything that she made. Barbara Beskine is a former occupational therapist who saw an interview with the CEO of IDEO, which is a design firm in Silicon Valley. They design the Apple Mouse. They design all sorts of cool crap. And she saw this guy and uh, sent him an email and said, you know, I'm a retired occupational therapist. I've got some ideas for new pro uh, products for older people. And the first thing that I've redesigned is walkers because walkers are the most poorly designed thing there is. It puts you in a poor position. It facilitates bad posture. People fall and break down. Somehow, and I guess this is why IDEO is IDEO. Somehow that email found its way to the CEO, and somehow he responded to her, and somehow he invited her in, and somehow she got from her retirement community uh, in Northern California to his office, and they hired her. Uh, and now here she is at 93 years old working with 20-year-olds. Uh, now she's 95, she's legally blind, and she still works part-time as a consultant. Uh, we've interviewed Carl Reiner and Dick Van Dyke, uh, all of these guys on a radio show. Carl Reiner's now 95. Uh, he's written six and has four other books. His ten, ten books since he turned 90. He told us the 90s have been the most productive, productive decade of my life. Harry Bernstein said my 90s have been the, the best decade of my life. This should give all of us encouragement because most of these people had no idea who they were or what they were doing when they were in their 70s and their 80s. And by the way, Carl shared this photo with us. It's he and Mel Brooks. They get together every single night with a TV tray and they watch Jeopardy. <clears throat> uh, Prehabilitation, I, you know, I just love. This, this is something that resonates, and if you've not heard of it, uh, you need to you need to pay attention because this is a message. Prehabilitation to me is, is aging's ultimate no-brainer. And here's why. It is a given that every one of us in this room and beyond is going to face a series of physical challenges, of physical setbacks as we age. You know, it's part of the package. We are biological beings. It makes no difference what shape we're in, we are going to face setbacks. And to a very large degree, the types of interventions that are made available to us are not determined by our age anymore. They're determined by our overall condition at the time. And to a large degree, 
the extent of our recovery after these interventions is determined by our overall fitness at the time. It's why they rush athletes into surgery right away, professional athletes. Yeah, they want to get them back on the field, but they don't want them to, their, their overall condition to deteriorate at all. So knowing that we're going to face these conditions, knowing that it's our overall health and well-being that will determine whether we get a new hip at 95 or a new nip, uh, knee at 93, knowing uh, that our overall condition will determine whether we can come back from a stroke at 88, why would we not all be preparing to prehabilitate? Life will knock us down and continue to knock us down, and it will try to count us out, period. You know, this is the bad news about being who we are. You can't escape it. You know, growing bowler is not about denying the reality of our mortality. It's not about pretending that bad stuff doesn't happen to us. Uh, but it is all about realizing the boundaries of possibility have been very, very poorly drawn. This is not exercise. This is prehabilitation. Here's my favorite prehabilitation video. This is Orville Rogers. Orville was 93 years old. Orville was... Orville started running at 92, but he did a whole lot of stuff before that. He was prehabilitated. He started running competitively at 90, uh, and at 93, he had a major stroke. Tire left side was paralyzed. His doctors, his family, his friends said, Orville, you're 93. You had a major stroke. It's done, my friend. You know, it's been a good ride. You know, take it easy. He said, no, I'm coming back. I love my lifestyle. I like to compete. Give me the most intensive rehabilitation program you can because I want to come back. Months, 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 months this dude worked. And here he is a couple of years back. He's 101 now. Uh, Orville is on the left, and he's running against Dixon Hempel on the right. Now, Dixon's an interesting story in his own. Dixon is, uh, is 92 in this video, and, and Orville is 99, I believe. Dixon was hit by a car riding his bike when he was in his late 70s, uh, punctured his lung, shattered uh, eight ribs, broke his pelvis, was in the hospital for six months, uh, and then he had a complete hip replacement a few years after that. So both of these fellows are prehabilitated. This is the finals of the U.S. track and field Masters National Championship in the 60-meter dash. Orville by five one hundredths of a second. Dixon said, if only I could lean, I would have beat him. And he probably would have. So, you know, we all talk about, you know, health care. You know, who's our health care provider? Who's our primary health care provider? You are. Period. The paradigm in healthcare moving forward is the patient at the center and all of these other people providing support when you need it, and yes, you will need it. You will need specialists, you will need uh, therapists, you will need all of this stuff, but the responsibility for your overall health and well-being begins and ends with you. And this is something that we have got to, uh, you know, make everybody understand. Uh, and this is a great sales pitch for you people because this truly is, is what's happening, and you've noticed it. Every major healthcare company in the world is pivoting toward prevention. Uh, you know, th th this is where the action is. Uh, we write about the health wealth connection and solving the longevity paradox. The longevity paradox is, is the idea that the thing that we most aspire to in the future, longevity, is the thing that most threatens the future longevity. We're all afraid that we're going to run out of money before we run out of time. It's a very real problem. Actuaries now calculate what they call longevity risk. People are very much afraid of this. There's a lot of very poor old people and no one wants to be there. So how do you solve the longevity paradox? Well, the answer is in the health-wealth connection because the two are inextricably linked. You cannot improve your overall health without improving your overall financial health. It just doesn't happen because the number one expense we will all have moving forward guaranteed is health care. Health care is going to continue to get better and better and more amazing and more amazing, but it will also continue to get more expensive. Absolutely. There's nobody that denies that. Uh, so if you improve your overall health and well-being right now, 
uh, you can save yourself literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, perhaps even millions of dollars in future health care costs. If you leverage the Health Wealth Connection, whatever retirement savings you have now or might gather in the future will go a whole lot longer. This ties right back into prehabilitation. Uh, it's the same thing. We have to learn how to leverage the Health Wealth Connection. All right, a little bit about the science of growing bolder. I know we've got doctors in the room that probably know far more about all of this stuff than I do, but I was a fanboy on this day when I ran into this woman at a conference. Uh, this is Elizabeth Blackburn. Uh, she won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for discovering telomerase, which is an enzyme that has a positive impact on telomeres. Now, if there is such thing as a biological clock that we have, it is telomeres. Telomeres are the caps on the ends of our chromosomes. She likens them to the plastic tips on the ends of our shoelaces. And when the plastic tips wear down, our shoelaces begin to fray. And the same thing happens uh, with our chromosomes. Uh, as we get older, telomeres shorten, 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 shorten. And at some point, they get so short that they don't protect, protect the DNA strands, and we can no longer, the cells can no longer replicate themselves uh, in, a, in a way that we remain healthy. That's when bad stuff starts to happen. So if we can slow the shortening of our telomeres, we can, if not increase the length of our life, certainly improve the quality of our life. So uh, guess what facilitates telomere health? is telomerase, the enzyme she discovered. And guess what affects telomerase? Lifestyle. Not just what we eat, not just how we move, but also how we think. Our DNA is listening to our thoughts, literally. It's absolutely true. For the first time, we know with certainty what we've all been saying for a long time. Uh, we know at a, at a cellular level that our lifestyle impacts the length and the quality of our lives. Uh, epigenetics is the science that proves that our biology is not an immutable fact of our DNA. That actually how we live, the lifestyle choices we make, to a some degree controls whether our genes express themselves or not. We may be genetically predisposed for any one of a number of conditions, breast cancer, prostate cancer, diabetes, you know it, name it. And how we live our lives will determine whether the genes responsible for those bad things happening express themselves or not. Epigenetics. You have more control over how you age than you know. I don't know whether anybody else talks about this. I just have been reading. I just become interested in exercise-induced angiogenesis. Uh, Capillaries are kind of the end of the line in terms of our vascular system, one cell thick, uh, the, you know, the smallest uh, of our vascular system. It's where all the stuff happens, where oxygen is, is, is given to the body. It's where all of the waste products are taken, taken away. And as we exercise, capillary development increases, and it increases everywhere, including the brain. So if you want more oxygen in your brain, this is one reason. Now, no one's proven any of this 100%, but this is one reason many people think those who exercise have a sharply reduced incidence of cognitive decline. Exercise-induced angiogenesis. You can talk about when you exercise mitochondria development, which are the little engines that give us energy. Uh, uh, one of the cool things, and this goes back to prehabilitation as well, is that Muscle fibers are unique in the body in that they're multinucleated. They have more than one nucleus. And here's the cool thing about that. When you exercise, when you do some, some work, your muscles begin to develop uh, multiple nuclei. And if you stop exercising, your muscles will atrophy. They'll get smaller. But here's what they've learned. Those nuclei that you developed never go away. They go dormant. You know, it's why the athletes always end up winning the biggest loser. You know, if you see a 350-pound former football player walk onto the stage early on, put your money on that dude because he used to work out and it's coming back. And it's the same right now. It's putting money in the bank. It's prehabilitating. Uh, if you think you might be weak when you get older, any exercise you do right now, even if you stop doing it, will come back and give you benefits when you get older. This is a reason everybody should be doing stuff right now. Uh, 
Deepak even says that, and I'll give no more introduction than that. We now know that human aging is entirely flexible, that the biological markers of aging can be reversed. Also, exercise and movement and mind-body coordination, you can reverse biological age by at least 20 to 30 years. Your chronological age does not have to match your biological age. Everybody's saying it, and you guys are at the front lines of it. I mean, you're the ones that, you know, you're the tip of the spear. This is the messaging. I mean, this is somehow the way you've got to figure out how to communicate with people. Compress morbidity, live long, die fast, live long, die short. Used to be a theory, now it's been proven. Uh, May not necessarily live any longer if you stay really active, if you make the right kind of lifestyle choices. Probably will live longer, but what we know for sure, you will compress the period of disease, disability, and morbidity at the end of your life. And and a typical, if you look at the if you look at the life arc of someone, you know, in our 40s and 50s, we start to to go downhill, and and people will spend two and three decades in decline. Uh, Some people will spend the last year of their life in bed. And let me tell you that science and medicine and technology will conspire to keep us alive a whole hell of a lot longer than we have a quality of life if we allow it to happen. Uh, You know, you're you're a a revenue stream at that particular point. Um, Who wants to live longer if you're not living well, if you're not having fun? So the name of the game is not necessarily how long we live, it's how fast we die. And I can tell you uh, and there's examples of everything, but, you know, since we're at the National Senior Games, I could pick a hundred different people, but let's go with Olga Kotelko. Olga Kotelko didn't start competing till her late 70s, and here's what Olga did. She hired a, 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 a coach because she not only wanted to run, she wanted to participate in the skill events. She wanted to do the hammer throw. She wanted to do the high jump. She wanted to do the long jump. She wanted to do the pole vault. She wanted to do these highly technical events You know, it's like they tell you dancing is one of the greatest things you can do when you get older. Learning to play an instrument is one of the greatest things you can do when you get older. She was was building up white matter in her brain. She exploded. They wrote books on her. What makes Olga go? Uh, By the time she was in her 90s, she held 38 world records. She traveled the world competing with her friends. She competed in the World Masters Track and Field Championship uh, in Europe one day, said goodbye to her friends, flew back to her home in Canada, uh, finished that week, a biography that she wrote uh, at the age of 93 and went to bed one night and never got up. It happens all the time. Period of decline, zero. The Art of the Growing Boulder Comeback. I'll wrap it up with a few things. There's a chapter in there which just kind of, not, you know, I guess you could call it takeaways, but it's some other stuff. Community is immunity. 148 different studies, 148 different studies have confirmed that those with strong social connections have a 50% reduced rate of mortality at any moment. As we age, low socialization is more harmful to our health than alcoholism, smoking, or obesity. Low socialization is the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. This is how important it is. There are so many lonely people as they get older. You know, it's great news. You guys are here. You're hanging out. You're meeting new people. You're having fun. Don't ever stop that. It's not just because, hey, it's fun to have friends. Friends will keep you alive. Good friends are the sickness, depression, and cognitive decline vaccine. Period. Adapt and accommodate. You know, I said we've interviewed tons of centenarians. We have. Uh, there's a lot of 100-year-olds that are in wheelchairs, wrapped up in blankets, uh, you know, not doing anything. God bless them. We love them. We do anything we can to help them, but I don't want to interview them because we can't learn from them. Uh, but when you run down the active centenarians, oh, my God. Uh, the good news about centenarians is as diverse a group as you can find. More women than men. Men, we've got some work to do. But other than that, rich, poor, urban, rural, black, white, yellow, brown, Everybody has a chance to live to 100. And again, genes are only 25%. But we interview them because we want to find, is there a common denominator? And and what I took away from all the interviews that we've done so far is that the, the one common thing shared by the very, very old is loss. I know it sounds like a bummer. But if you live long enough, 
You're going to lose your keys. You're going to lose your ability to drive. You're going to lose some of your hearing. You're going to lose some of your sight. You're going to lose your spouse. Uh, you're going to lose a little bit of your cognition. You know, it's lost, 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 lost. Somehow, active centenarians have the ability to mourn and move on. They have the ability to find beauty in what remains. So we have to learn to adapt and accommodate. And here's from a sporting theme, one of my favorites, Gordy Shields, who was a world-class tennis player, a master's tennis player. He beat anybody he came up with, but he had this degenerative spine condition that got worse and worse and worse. And pretty soon he was walking like this, and he couldn't play tennis anymore, and he was bummed out, and he didn't want to do anything. And he's walking down the street, and he sees a bunch of guys, you know, like we all see in the street riding their bikes by there. And they're all riding their bikes, and he, and he looks up at him and says, you know what? That's pretty much the same position that I'm in. I'm going to ride a bike. <laughs> he adapted, he accommodated, and then he kicked ass. Uh, he became the, the greatest over 90 cycle guy that, uh, that, that was alive at the time. Grandma Moses, I can give you a thousand examples, but we all know Grandma Moses. Many of us don't know. She was an embroiderer. That's what she lived to do. She, she did fine needlework. She couldn't do enough of it. It was her life. And then she had arthritis, and her fingers got so crippled and arthritic, she couldn't do that anymore. But she figured out she could hold a paintbrush, and she had never painted in her life. So she started painting these naive folk art paintings. She painted a thousand of them before she died. They sold for millions of dollars now. And she said, it's the painting's not important. It's just keeping moving that's important. We have to figure out how to adapt and accommodate. And these are your clients. You know, they, 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 this is what makes you guys who you are, what makes you rock stars. Everyone is different. Everybody's got different things they've got to adapt to and accommodate. You know, it's been said that when you get to be my age, older, Older, uh, you know, especially older people, it's a season without a purpose. You know, what the hell are we here for? Uh, everybody wants to worry about their legacy. What's going to be my legacy? Uh, I hate that conversation because here's the truth. Your legacy is nothing more than what people say about you when you're gone, period. So my question to you is, what are they going to say about you when you're gone? You know, she was nice. She was encouraging. Let me tell you a story about her. She was gracious. She was, it doesn't take money to leave a legacy. It just takes a desire to make a difference, to move forward and to give back. So if I ask you now to close your eyes and imagine somebody in their 90s, and then I ask you, what do you see? What are they doing? How are they moving? What do they look like? And if you, and if you imagine this, in detail, and close enough, you are practicing the art of visualization. This is something that is practiced by literally every single elite athlete in the world on a daily basis. It's not garbage, it's science, what the mind believes the body embraces. So whatever it is you're imagining, imagine more. Understand that what you're putting in your mind will ultimately end up in your body. And I think when you're in your business, we should always be visualizing. Your clients should always be visualizing. You can sit there and you can do whatever number of reps or exercise you're going to do and you will get benefit out of it. Uh, but if you're visualizing that you are building muscle, you are building flexibility, you are building stamina, you are feeling good, it will go so much further. You know, I often quote a study, and I took it out because those of you who have been here five times have heard it before. Uh, you know, there was a study where they took a large group of sedentary 80-year-olds. They divided them up into two groups, uh, gave them all a baseline fitness test. One group was exercised every single day for six months. The other group, no exercise at all. But they exposed them to positive images of older people doing cool stuff. Strong, powerful, active, interesting, sexy older people. At the end of six months, I got them all back together, gave them another baseline fitness test in the group that did no exercise at all, but was exposed to the positive images of aging, showed more improvement in their overall physical abilities in the group that exercised every day, but was not exposed to these positive images of aging. You're in that business. You're in the business of changing people's belief system about what's possible. You need to practice visualization on your own, and you need to help others. And say yes. You know, I mentioned that before. You know, we all have to learn how to say yes. We need to create a culture of yes uh, 
in, in, in all age groups, but certainly in older age groups. It becomes too easy to say no. You know, I read a study that said that only in senior living, uh, they have a 20 to 30 percent participation rate uh, in their activities. So they all, so all senior living is thinking, you know, what's wrong with our activities? We've we, we, we got to replace Zumba with whatever. We've got to replace this with that. And no, you know, before you worry about that, you've got to change belief systems. These people are not sitting on their couch because they don't want to do Zumba. They're sitting in a room because they don't believe more is possible. They're sitting in a room because they've learned to say no. They're sitting in a room because they live inside a culture of no instead of a culture of yes. I mean, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, but this is, whew, it's going to be done in 40 or 50 or 60 years. This is the time of opportunity for us as individuals, for us as business people. Uh, we're here to change the culture of aging. We're here to rebrand what's possible as we age. Uh, I'll leave you with this because I love this story. It, it kind of goes to leaving legacy. Uh, this is Ruth Hamilton, 109 years old. Uh, we did a story on Ruth when I worked for a TV station years ago when she turned 105. The mayor of Orlando showed up. They celebrated her. She was witty. She was funny. Uh, we were sitting in our office one day a few years later and say, wonder what ever happened to Ruth. You think she's still alive? So we ran her down, and we found her living on the top floor of an assisted living home. And you know what the top floor means. There's only one more floor after that. And um, this is the day we found her. She's laying in her bed. The next day, she was sitting in a big room about this size in a wheelchair with a blanket around her, a TV, small TV on in the corner, and maybe 50 old people, none of, them, none of them paying any attention to one another, none of them communicating. They're just sitting there, and this is how they entertain them. So I talked to the, to, to the nurse there, and she said, Ruth has not had a visitor in two and a half years. She outlived everybody. She had no friends. She had no visitors, and these guys were doing as well as they could with the limited resources they had. So... We said, Ruth, you know, it's Mark Middleton and Bill Schaefer. Do you remember us? We did a story on you years ago. She had no idea who we were. She was out of it. She wasn't asleep, but she was. Uh, finally, she kind of woke up a little bit. We said, let's go back. And so we did. And she woke up a little bit quicker and paid a little more attention. And we said, all right, let's go back. And then we did. And she woke up a little bit quicker and paid a little more attention. And she got a smile on her face and a twinkle in her eye. And we said, let's go back. And we did. And about the sixth time we were there, I opened up my laptop and I said, Ruth, this little dot, which she couldn't see because her eyes were terrible, uh, is a camera. And this computer is hooked up to the internet and I'm going to hit play and you can say whatever you want and whatever you say we're going to put on the internet and people all over the world are going to learn from you what it's like to be 109. And when that statement was said, she, a former teacher, the first female legislator in New Hampshire, taught diction to Hollywood starlets decades ago, lit up. You mean my relatives in Denmark will hear this? I don't think she had any relatives in Denmark. <laughs> Ru <laughs> Ruth, everybody's going to hear it. So we went back maybe 10 times in the next six months, the final six months of her life. Uh, always took the laptop, always recorded one of Ruth's blogs, and this is the kind of stuff she did. Well, I should say we dubbed her Ruth 1898. You know, we, we had to get a little promotional value out of it. Uh, uh, the world's oldest blogger. <clears throat> Did I not have it? If I don't have the video, I apologize. Uh, I didn't have it. I apologize. Uh, she, she would go off on, uh, the video I was going to show you, she's re reciting a poem in Latin that came back to her. And, and admittedly, uh, Ruth was, was, was unique. You know, she came back probably far more than most people would. She was very, very sharp. Uh, but the point of the story is, uh, uh, you know, on the left is the first time we saw Ruth, and on the right is the last time, six months later. She knew we were coming. She put her fingernail polish on. She put her, her Mardi Gras beads around her neck. Uh, you know, she was ready to party. Uh, we did not give Ruth her life back. We gave her a quality of life back in her final six months. And, and so I, I ask you this, uh, who's your Ruth? It doesn't have to be a 109-year-old woman. It could be, you know, your next-door neighbor. It could be a 45-year-old guy who's, you know, whatever. We've all got someone that we can make an impact on without doing too much. And I think it's all incumbent upon us. You know, maybe I got this in the wrong way. Here we go! We've got everything in our minds. And she's got it, and everybody's got it.
all different. But we are there, and if we keep using that mind, you got to oil it. And the way you oil it is to use it. And I go over poems. I can recite poems that I learned in, in kindergarten, I guess. <laughs> can you recite a poem now? A poem? Yes. Well, let's see, what could I say? Oh, I, I could say it in, in Latin. Mica, mica, padre stella, mirror quinum si sam bella, splendens imilo, adla wailet gama kylo. That's twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> I said it in Latin. Mica, mica, see, twinkle, twinkle. Mica, mica, padre stella, small star. How I wonder what you are, up and in the sky so blue. What are you doing up there? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I use my mind. If you don't use it, it'll go to waste. And that's why people get senile, they call it, because the mind has never been used. It just sits there. But you've got to work it. You gotta keep it moving, and I sure keep mine going. I love to eat and talk. <laughs>